Welcome Pacific Northwest tree fruit community. My name is Dave Crowder and I'm the director of the Washington State University Decision Aid System. In preparation of a workshop we're about to host on codling moth, I would like to talk about the features available on the Decision Aid System to aid users manage this important tree fruit pest. The heart of codling moth management relies on understanding its phenology. Phenology is understanding the emergence of various life stages of insect populations, which are predictable based on temperature or other environmental factors. And models of such phenological events can show when life stages susceptible to management are present in the field. We know codling moth overwinter as mature larvae and cocoons and begin to pupate right before the field season starts. After bloom, adults start to emerge lay eggs, and then there are two to three generations per year in Washington. And these stages are highly predictable based on temperature. To understand phenology and to generate the outputs of a phenological model, we first need to understand weather data. The WSU system accomplishes this by pulling in a network of weather stations, both owned by WSU through the Agricultural Weather Net, as well as the broader Pacific Northwest through the Agrimet network, Users can also log on to our system with virtual stations, which are shown in the bottom left here, where you can actually put a pin on the map if there's no other station nearby, and put a pin right on top of your field, and we will pull gridded weather data from our national provider for you. Users are also allowed to connect private weather stations through the WSU Agricultural Weather Network, an example of multiple stations owned by a private company in Oregon are shown on the right that are connected to our system and can serve as inputs for the de decision aid system models. And once you've picked weather stations on our system, the codling moth phenology model will run automatically. And what this does is it pulls in temperature from the locations that you've selected and calculates a unit of heat called degree days. Degree days reflect how many heat units above a certain temperature for development have accumulated for the insect. And the more degree days that have accumulated, the further along the population will be in the year. And this is a highly predictable event. So our system at a particular location is pulling in these temperature data and running it through a phenology model and then outputting the conditions seen here, where it will tell users what is going on with adults, eggs, and larvae in the population provide links for conventional and man organic management options, as well as show charts of what will happen into the future based on forecasted weather data. Our system also offers historical data through a feature we call Time Machine, which is just made available to our users in 2023. As we can see here, if I log on to the Codling Moth model on March 13th, it's actually not even running at some of the stations because not enough of these heat units have accumulated but I can click on this time machine button and go back and set my calendar to a date in the past and actually look at this same orchard at what happened. This may be a really helpful tool if you want to compare to a previous year where management was very easy or very difficult, or you remember specific events that happened and just wanna compare where we are in the 2023 season compared to previous years. Our system also links to spray guides and a table that has MRLs. So regardless of which stage of the crop you are in or where you might be exporting to, you can get information appropriate to codling moth management. Now various models for codling moth exist, and I'm showing three publications that each capture different aspects of phenology and come to slightly different conclusions. One of these models, the model of Alan Knight, uses a biofix based on trap catch data to simulate when codling moth have first started emerging in orchards. The other two models do not use a biofix and start accumulating heat units on January 1st. And these are the models that are used on the decision aid system. So why does the decision aid system not use a biofix based on trap data when so many growers are actively collecting codling moth in pheromone traps? Well, the reason is that the efficiency of trapping is highly variable. Many different factors can determine the rate of capture or the efficiency of how well your traps work, such as pesticides, orchard architecture, 
the type of trap you use, how well it's maintained. And then two issues that I've highlighted, which I'll discuss further, include environmental conditions, as well as the density of the population and the point in the phenological cycle. Now, especially in the first generation, codling moth densities tend to be low, and they also tend to be quite variable within the typical orchard. These are data from Vince Jones and Mike Doerr showing a 12-acre block um, that was intensively trapped, and it shows that codling moth populations are far from evenly distributed. In fact, they're highly uneven. Now in the real world where growers put a trap every two and a half or five acres, this 12 acre block likely only has three to five traps in it. And depending on where you put those traps, you might see an extremely high density of codling moth or perhaps none. To capture this, I grabbed some slides that Betsy Beers, our collaborator in the WSU Wenatchee Tree Fruit Center was willing to provide to, ex to show how this might work. In our first case, we have a low density of moths and a, high, and a low density of traps. We know that traps typically only collect moths that are nearby and are most effective only up to 30 feet. So in this situation, if our trap was located in this location here, while there are moths throughout the orchard, we may not be capturing them at all. A second situation here shows where we have medium moth densities, but still low traps. And again, our estimate of the density of this situation is not going to be as good as it could be or as good as it might be if we had many more traps estimating the density throughout this block. Finally, we have case three where we actually have a good trapping density, but again, we have a low density of moths. So while moths are present throughout the orchard, only a proportion of the traps are probably actually collecting them while the other traps may all be returning zeros. We can actually simulate these phenomenon and show when there are a certain number of adults in an orchard and you only capture a certain percentage of them, how might it actually look when we're comparing what we see in our fields compared to the phenology model? So on the, the next three slides in every panel, the blue line represents the phenology model. So this is predicting kind of a perfect emergence curve of codling moth. And the orange or red line is showing the potential trap catch based on a simulation. The studies that have shown the highest capture rate, and this is also often done with mark recapture studies, show that only about 1% of codling moth in an orchard are actually captured in traps. And if we assume that we catch 1% of the moths, we see here that we actually can reflect the phenological model pretty well in our trap catch data. However, here's a simulation of six different orchards when we only catch 0.5% of the moths. And what we can start to see here is that the growers data, again, represented in the orchard, these are simulated data for six different orchards, are all highly variable. In some cases, like the bottom middle panel, the data actually conform to the phenology model fairly well. But in the top middle panel, um, the data seem to be quite off from the phenology model. If we lower the capture rate even more, 0.25% has actually been shown to be a reasonable capture rate in many studies, even though it might sound low, this is probably about the number of moths that you're actually collecting. We see even more variability in our simulated trap catch. All of these could be orchards that are completely realistic, even if the phenology model is right. The point being, Trap catch data is very difficult to estimate the first catch of moths. Again, I want to show a simulation of 50 orchards. If we capture 1% of the moths, when might that first moth be captured? In only about 25% of the cases is the first moth captured when it emerges. And then we see this kind of long tail to the distribution that in one of our orchards in the simulation, the first moth was not even captured until 300 degree days. Again, I wanna highlight that these simulations are showing what could happen if the phenology model is right. All of these data showing a delay in when you might catch your first moth are just based on sampling error. When we lower the capture rate even more and continue to do these simulations, we can see even more disjointed distributions where it might even be likely that we don't catch our first moth until after 220 degree days, even though they've been there for at least 50 degree days. 
Similarly, with a 0.25% capture rate, we can see a very long tailed distribution where in some of my simulations, the first moth was not even captured until after 400 degree days, even though they had emerged at 175 degree days. Point is, you can't set a biofix without high moth densities. And even the Allen Knight paper showed that the second generation curves in his study matched the model without a biofix. So when you look at the data, especially in the first generation, it can be very difficult to capture moths effectively and using a biofix may throw off your management. There is one caveat that I'd like to mention that weather may induce real delays. When I mean a real delay, I mean one that's not just a statistical artifact of sampling and trapping design. But we do know that codling moth, once they emerge, will not fly if the temperatures are too low or if it's rainy, rainy or windy. So there are conditions where moths may have emerged in your orchard, but you will not be capturing them. And they may not be mating or laying eggs, which might cause a real shift in the phenology model. We have tools such as these flight models on DAS that can help you estimate how active your codling moth population might be at any time and try to figure out if the zeros you might be seeing in your traps are due to statistical error or due to weather-induced delays. In the second half of this talk, I'd like to talk about some of the advanced features we have for codling moth to aid with the standard phenology model in management. I will talk about alerts, pesticide effects models, regional mapping tools, and smaller scale visualization tools that individual users can take advantage of. First, alerts. Many things in DAS and in the tree fruit industry in particular require a proactive management approach. To accomplish this, in 2023, we released alerts for the first time. For codling moth, you may want alerts related to when adult emergence is expected to begin, when egg hatch or larval emergence is expected to begin, and when those same thresholds occur in the second generation. You can also set alerts to 14, 7, or 10 days, and you can vary it up at each of your stations. You can pick alerts at certain stations and not others, or set different intervals. If you've done this, you will receive text messages or phone, sorry, or emails, um, or both, seven to 14 days of these key events occurring for the stations that you have selected as a subscriber. Second, I'd like to talk about a pesticide evaluator tool. With our phenology model, we can actually predict when particular stages of the codling moth are present. And with this information, we can in turn predict how effective pesticides might be based on when they are applied to your orchard. Now, obviously, if you're applying a pesticide like an avicide to kill eggs, but the eggs are not present, it's not going to be as effective as if those eggs are present. So I wanna show the output of this pesticide evaluator. I've entered in a spray for my orchard of May 16th, and it starts to show the chunks of the population that are expected to be killed. And I have a prediction without mating disruption that my population would be reduced by 17% or by 82% if I was using mating disruption. Users can then go back in and enter more records to refine their plan. Here I've added two additional sprays about two weeks after my first spray and four weeks after my first spray. I run the model again and I now see that my plan is reducing the codling moth population by 88% without mating disruption or 98% with mating disruption. Now, as this is a forecasting tool, it will get better and better as the date actually approaches and the weather forecasts become refined. So predicting your pesticide plan two months in advance may not be perfect, but the closer you get to the actual dates when sprays are necessary, it will start to become more accurate. And we hope this is a tool that growers can use to plan in advance when their sprays might need to occur and make sure they have appropriate insecticide inventory on hand at the right time, at the right location. Just to give you an example of timing is important, and obviously it's almost impossible to get your timings on at exactly the right time in every orchard. Um, but we can see here, these are data from Vince Jones using two of the common codling moth strategies of delayed first cover, 
or a 425 degree day treatment plus 14 days for larvae, um, that anywhere between about 150 to $200 can be lost per acre as you get two weeks away from the optimal timings. So trying to hone in on when those populations are really active is critically important for generating effective economic returns. Third, a tool of DAS that we have on the back end but hasn't yet been released on the main site, but we hope to provide updates throughout this year, are regional maps. Here I'm showing May 1st, 2022, all of the ag weather net stations that were reporting on our system and the degree days for codling moth, along with a legend that identifies key thresholds of when adults may be present, when eggs are beginning to hatch, and when that 425 degree day critical larval period has been reached. If we click through to May 16th, we see that many more orchards are reaching these thresholds. June 1st, we see most of the Southern Washington has begun egg hatch and larval emergence, while parts up through OMAC and into Canada may not have reached these thresholds yet. And tree fruit orchards in Eastern Washington are still um, only have adults flying around with no eggs or larvae. And then again, by June 16th, 2022, we'd seen that most of the map had filled in and was reaching these critical thresholds where management was needed. We hope these kind of tools can complement the site-specific features of DAS to help growers get a regional view of what might be going on in and around their orchards and just across the state in general. Finally, I'd like to talk about tools that we have to help you visualize your own data. Many users of DAS collect their own trap catch data, but to date, DAS has not been able to incorporate those data in any meaningful way. And we started to develop some new tools that will change that. Here I see a map of a simulated, and if you can see these little gray bars, those are locations that I say I've had traps. And we have a very simple template where if you have the latitude and longitude of your traps, as well as the value and the number of insects it collects, it will automatically produce a visualization of your data that shows areas of high or low density in this case. Again, this may help you visualize the data you're collecting in your block. And if you're just entering it into a spreadsheet, um, again, this might provide a nice mapping tool that can help you out. This is an example of a user that actually mapped out from their own orchard and identified a couple of hotspots that they were able to clean up the next year and improve their situation. So the way that this mapping works very briefly is if you do collect data at different locations, we can make a prediction of a different location based on an idea of interpolation. And this is the idea that codling moth and other insects tend to be what is called spatially correlated. So locations that are close in space tend to have similar insect numbers. So by using different numbers of traps and interpolating throughout a grid, we can predict at any location what the population might look like. The final thing I'll mention is a new tool that's under development. And if we find enough users are interested in entering data into our system, we'd like to continue to refine this, where we have a beta version of a tool where you can actually select your farms on the map, enter in your trap data, and visualize that potentially alongside the phenology model. I hope this talk was helpful in giving you a sense of the complex dynamics of codling moth that require growers and other industry partners to really know phenology and population dynamics, both. They're not the same thing. Under, your trap catch reflects population dynamics, whereas the phenology model is more of a mechanistic physiological event. DAS can aid users in predicting these phenological patterns and provides tools to relate phenological events to management. Future iterations of the decision aid system will allow users to better incorporate their own data alongside phenology models to aid in decision making through features such as perhaps determining biofix or adapting the phenology models to changing conditions that are being seen in orchards. If you have any questions about the WSU Decision Aid System, you can contact our team at wsu.das at wsu.edu. I'm gonna thank you for your attention, and we hope this video is helpful in learning a little bit more about the codling moth.